Hi, everyone. I'm waiting for Stephanie Jacques. Here she is. I love your outside. Ooh, oh, yes. yes. We You're are outside. I am. I'm in the Bay Area, and I have my niece here with me, and she just does better if we're outside. She just... Amazing. Yeah, she, she does. Is a happier they soul. Know. They so, know. So I'm like, all right, we'll do this outside. Absolutely. Just create peace. <laughs> are you, now, you're not from the Bay Area. Where did I you am. grow up? You're from the Bay Area. I am. My gosh. Yeah. You love I, me. Um, I grew up in a suburb of Oakland, and um, my half-brothers, almost everybody in my family is still here, except for my oldest half-brother moved to Australia. So he's been in Australia for 20 years. Oh, wow. <laughs> he's a lot wow. older than me. Um, have you been to visit? Do you I love? have. I have. And um, they've come over here a lot. They yeah. were over here a few years ago with my nieces and nephews, and I want to get back out there. Um, but thankful for technology, I'm able to, like, talk to my niece. She just turned 20, and um, we talk all the time. And she's like, I'm, I'm, I'm with you guys in America. And, and I'm like, yes. Oh, my God, that's amazing. So she posts so on Instagram, and we share each other's posts. And it's pretty awesome because, oh. like, a generation apart, it's – and a continent – apart and oceans and um i'm i'm very thankful that we have that relationship oh and yeah and so connected still still and it's been good to be here and be with my sister i mean in my adult life i've never spent this much time with my sister ever i i, met, I left home at 19 so wow <laughs> and she's older so she left home before that so so you left and you came to Nashville from the Bay Area. Um, no, I had a few stops before Nashville. Oh, was a few yeah, stops. okay. Um, I went to L.A. Uh -huh. um, to start college. Then I Amazing. went to D.C. to do college. I went to Howard University. Then I went back to L.A. for Cal State Northridge. And then I stayed in L.A. and toured and sang and kind of got involved in the music scene. Um, did some mommy and me music. And then I went to North Carolina for like a few months and then Nashville. So I've just That's, bounced around. But I was in I LA for it. a long, I mean, I kind of forget sometimes that DC was scattered in there. Yeah. But absolutely. a lot of my tribe is from DC and um, a, a great portion of my tribe is from LA and they went to UCLA. Um, and I have a, I have a big community there. That's awesome. But it's, LA was different, it's different me. worlds. It's very different worlds. And so during all this, as I look on like social media and I'm even how people are portraying what's going on, I'm like, oh, I'm seeing a lot of different viewpoints because it's, it's different racial Ugh. worlds. It's different culturally. Yes. And, tell me about how it's different. I see that too. Well, I'm from, see. I'm from the Bay Area, which mm -hmm. a lot of people would say very diverse, but I'm from a town called Pleasanton and I'm in my thirties. And when I was growing up there, I was the only, one of the only black people in Pleasanton. Wow. And I say this and I'm mixed. Um, wow. And my brother and my sister's Korean and my grandma raised us. So some child is, is, is excuse me. Oh, it's okay. You hear this? Hold um, on, tell this, hold on, Stephanie. Guys, no, don't do that anymore. Marshall's taking a break, okay? He'll be out in just a little bit. Sorry about that. Okay, now we can. Oh, it's talk. okay. I understand. There's okay. a baby. You just can't see her. <laughs> oh, the baby. Oh, look at her. Hi, Ruby. Baby. Hi, Ruby. Oh, she just likes to talk Ruby. to the wind. So. Oh, my gosh. Yes, she does. Oh, my gosh. So. Hi. We're just telling some stories, Ruby. Yeah, Auntie. Stone I mean, can stories. we write that song, "Talk to the Wind"? We can. 
Can we write? She just wants, she just likes to talk to the wind and write it literally about Ruby. Yeah. She does. She sits out here for hours and talks to the wind. And I'm like, what are you guys, what are you guys talking about? Sometimes it gets loud and sometimes they're really quiet. I'm like, this is, oh my gosh. This is interesting. I I do it every day. Talking about, yes, absolutely. Okay, so I'm sorry, I interrupted you. You were telling me about the difference of what you're seeing from your perspective in LA and Nashville and, and well, Bay Area. What, I, what I'm noticing is in my Bay Area, mm-hmm. from my hometown, it is a more conservative town in general. A lot of the people I went to school with, I, I think they forget that I'm black. Um, so right. there's no filter when they're talking and they are worried about riots. They are worried about the riots in buildings. Wow. And not to say that they're not worried about people, but they're very concerned about rioting. Buildings. That is their <laughs> rhetoric. Um, and I'm, and then I look at people, my friends from like Howard and black colleges and they're, they, while we, while they don't support rioting, their posts are about people. Right. Their posts are about the people. And it's so, those two are two extremes. Then you have my friends in like LA and people I know who are very much active. They like did the women's march. They've, we have battled, but they're realizing in my stories that I'm like, I realized I never shared all mm. the things that happened to me in LA when I was there. Cause I was like, Oh, you guys know, because I'd come from DC. I'm like, you guys know that I get pulled over all the time. And one actually called and apologized, which was not necessary, um, and right. said, I didn't know that you used to get pulled over. I'm like, I get pulled over all the time. And I'm very aware that you don't. I just don't bring it up because who wants to be that bummer in the friend group? It's like, guess what happened today, you guys? I was going to oh get gosh. out of my car. Like, Stephanie. Uh, oh, my gosh. Right. I get, I get it. Yeah, you're like, I, why would I want to bring that up? Like you don't, yeah, you don't right. want to be, and this is what I found for me, because I grew up in a very white world, Right. I was aware I already stood out. So the easier, it, it was easy to just blend and not point out the differences so obviously. And that right. carried into my adult life. It carried into my relationships so much so that I've had to have conversations even this week with friends and say, I see your silence. And I'm, I'm affected by your silence. Mm, like I need you to say something. Yes. Because I know what your heart is. Right. But I need you to verbalize it. Right. I need you. Because your friend is black and I'm black. Yes. Like, oh my gosh. And they're like, oh, oh, like they didn't even realize that they, their silence affected me Mm -hmm. in such a deep way. Yes. Hi mama. Yeah, and I'm so happy that you, I'm so glad that you were transparent enough to say that and took the step to say that because that's probably the last time they'll be silent because they love you. And I know the people I surround myself love me. So I, I will say that I have deleted some people on Instagram and I have, I have a very hard line. There's no gray area to me um, in terms of hate. I don't believe it's right. a political issue. I believe it's a human issue. So Absolutely. some people that were I was following mocked Tuesday and, and were minimizing things and I'm just not standing wow. for that. And, and it's harder being in Nashville and I do feel like I'm the minority um, in terms of race in my crowd sure. in Nashville. I don't... I wasn't from there, so I don't always understand the way it is. I don't always understand why it's segregated t- to such a big degree. Because <laughs> I, right. I also grew up not segregated. I grew up with my right. sister and my brother are Korean. My mom is very much about let's see color and let's learn about our histories and let's learn about our identities and let's figure out where you guys go like my sister was part of an Asian sorority and at Berkeley I was part of a black sorority I I was never felt small right but I did have many advantages by having a white mom 
and living in a white neighborhood in the right. 80s and 90s. Wow. Like so many advantages based off of her privilege that if I had grown up with my dad, I would not have. Wow. Uh, and I'm that very aware of that now. That says it all right there. I mean, like, that's I wouldn't so have beautiful. grown up in that town. They would have sold right. that town to. There was no black homeowners in my neighborhood. Not at one. Right. None of my Absolutely. childhood friends are black. Um, none. None are even it's Asian or, it, or Hispanic. They're all so when, white. All white. And so when you went to, when did you meet your first boyfriend? I met him. I didn't date in, um, in high school. I was very much just about singing. And um, I had a lot of pain and family turmoil. So I started dating when I was 18. And I met him when I was 18. And he was from Oakland. And I wasn't allowed to go to Oakland as a kid because it's dangerous, which makes is, it more there enticing. There are dangerous yeah. places everywhere, people. Yeah. So that's another, that was put in my head. Oh, I I my see. first be racist. But I'm like, there's dangerous places everywhere. Some of the most beautiful places I've seen are in Oakland or in places, or in DC. Howard is in one of, used to be in one of the worst areas. Right. It's not, so, it's just. And it's not. It's not. Oh, girl, I love that information. Uh, like, so I met him and he expanded my world. Like, his name was John. I still talk to him occasionally. He's married and has kids and life has gone on. But I was like, oh, you, you aren't like me. And he's like, no, <laughs> no, you're, you're very green. Like how they say like you're green in the industry. I was green to like my race. And who I was. <laughs> I just met my dad yeah. when I was 16. Um, my dad didn't raise me. So I just met him. So I didn't even know. Like how. I always say I didn't know how to be black. And I didn't realize that it wasn't. I was black. I thought I had to learn how to be black. That's why I just started reading books. And I started surrounding myself with people that had the culture that I didn't grow up with. I grew up with Southern culture. But I didn't grow up with black culture. Absolutely. And it was a part of my identity I needed to find. Mm -hmm. And oh, yeah. I thought it was through getting braids, or I thought it was through singing R&B music, or through dating somebody black. But it was really through me figuring out who I am mm -hmm. as a mixed woman. And even privilege yeah. in being mixed, because I'm lighter skinned. Um, mm -hmm. So I get treated differently than my darker skinned sisters. I, I do. Um, mm. my God. And realizing all of that and being open to talk to my black friends and say, guys, I'm from Pleasanton. Like, I don't want to offend anybody, but I don't know anything but the month long Black History Month and Rosa Parks and Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. Like, that's all I know. Wow. Um, so teach me. Oh, Teach I love me. this. And they taught me. And I learned that Malcolm X and Martin Luther King are both promoted nonviolence. You wouldn't get that from media. You would think Malcolm X was angry and Martin Luther King was, was peaceful. They're both mm -hmm. peaceful. They had different ways of approaching um, aggression. Mm -hmm. But yep. they, are, and they never promoted violence either one right right and um there was some just spoke about. more aggressively hmm? yeah and there was lots to be angry about there was lots I mean, to be angry about my dad grew up so, back in there and um there's a lot to be <laughs> there's a lot to still be angry about um yeah oh yeah but there's there's so much to learn about why riots happen there's so much to learn about why the uprisings have happened every 10, 15 years. Yeah. Um, I spoke with my dad a few days ago and we were talking about home ownership. Mm -hmm. And because I kept hearing um, the news saying, I don't know, understand why they are destroying their communities. Like, why are they destroying their communities? And my dad said, and he used to work in the mortgage business and 
He said, they're not destroying their communities. You haven't allowed them to buy homes in those communities. You haven't allowed them to own land in those communities. That's not their communities. They don't have right. a stake in it. Not to say that it's okay to, to destroy businesses, but you haven't allowed the majority of people that are black to own a home. And yeah. if you have allowed them to own a home, you have made their interest rates significantly greater. Like all the mm. policies are to own a home in this neighborhood or to own a home in this neighborhood. So you're like, you're destroying your neighborhood. You're destroying the small square that you are allowing them to rent at astronomical prices and right. have food deserts and aren't allowing, right. don't have tax dollars going to schools. Right. The rhetoric that I keep hearing from the news is upsetting. It's to me. very upsetting. As, imagine yeah. if the news was covering, imagine if the news was covering the progress and covering the connections and all the little moments that I'm seeing that people are reposting on their stories, yes. people bringing water to the officers. Um, I saw a young man bringing water to a group of officers and they're like, why is he approaching us? And he's like, I know y'all are thirsty. Here's a bunch of water they gave it to us. Thank you for letting us do this peacefully. This is a peaceful yeah. demonstration and just God bless y'all. And then like walked off and I'm like, that should be on the news. Like there's so many beautiful moments that should be on the news. There's so many moments that I think need to be, have a light shine on them. Mm -hmm. And the news is showing a lot of the angry moments. And yes, I yeah. think all of it should be covered to a point, but Look at the thousands of people just standing in the heat. Look at the yeah. thousands of people standing in the midst of COVID, right. risking their actual lives, not just against the police, but against a disease that yeah. is going to kill blacks and browns significantly more than whites to fight against something that is bigger, that their parents fought and their grandparents fought for. Yes. Okay. Yes, Stephanie. Absolutely. And, absolutely. And I... It's hard. I've had some conversations with some of my friends who are like, when are you going back to Nashville? When are you going back? I left because of COVID because um, everything shut down. I didn't have work. And I said, I was scared. Like a few days ago, I was scared to fly back. I'm like, I, my black friends were like, it's a war. It's a war. And we're calling out businesses. And my dad was like, be careful. Be careful when calling out businesses. He's like, there's always retribution. Mm. There you go. Sorry, she's, she wants to be a part, so. I love that you have this time with her. Yes, she is a part. Yeah, and by the likes... way, Ruby, we want you to reap the benefits of everything. Yes. She's very small and very cute. <laughs> she is insanely cute. She's also mixed. She's Korean and white, right? You're oh, a sweet girl. girl, I love it. And her name oh. is Ruby. Her name is Ruby. So that is, that is, so your dad said, be careful calling out businesses. Yeah. My dad's like, do it. Um, do what you want to do, but realize the risks of it. it and I mind. think that comes from a black man in his seventies um, who has seen the progression, who war, has worked in a white world for most of his life, who dated white women. All my brothers and sisters are, um, we're all mixed. We're all mm -hmm. biracial and has seen how it's treated him. And mm -hmm. I'm his only daughter and he's worried and he's nervous um, with me being in the South. And, yeah. I, and I hear a lot people going, well, Nashville, it's liberal and it's progressive. Mm. As, as much as it is, and let's just give, let's just say it is, let's just say Nashville is. There's it's a white. lot of areas right around Nashville where I am watched I am followed by cops. And um, if I yeah. go on a longer road, I, they follow me to the next exit to see where I'm going. Um, there are times when I, I don't go to places because I'm like, I, I don't, that's not where my people are. <laughs> I'm like, I don't right. feel safe there. Right. <laughs> and that's wow. in, that's not far out of Nashville. Right. And in Nashville, I've gotten watched in stores in yeah. the malls and and I know you just know when you're being watched by security you you know yeah. I've Absolutely. never 
I've never had somebody grab their purse or do that to me, but that has mm -hmm. always happened when I'm with a boyfriend um, or somebody, like a man. Like they have a fear of, um, there are a lot that have a fear of a black man, like being in an elevator with you or on the side of a street and they, they, they just move. Like instinctively, people move further away. Wow. Especially on Broadway. Like it's just, it's- Oh my God. When you, when you see it, you can't unsee it. Like you start, when you start noticing how people instinctively mm. are with their biases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I say right. people in a very broad way, I don't ever mean every single person. But just be, you see it's it a lot. You see it. Yeah. You see it. Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I had to talk to my mom. Um, I remember once she, we went to Oakland and as soon as we got off the freeway, she locked the doors and I was like, those people aren't going to um, rob us. Mom. I know. Like black culture, you know we, we hang out on stoops. We hang out on the street. Like we do yeah. those things. I'm like, that doesn't mean that they're going to jump in the car. Like, Right. It's those little things like let's lock our doors. Like, you know, that could happen here too. Anybody could just come up to you at a stoplight and jump in your car. It doesn't just happen Seriously. in black neighborhoods. Absolutely. Um, when I first moved here, I came from uh, Lawrence, Kansas, which I mean, okay. my hometown. Yeah. It's like we, uh, Lawrence, Kansas is like predominantly white, but it's a college town. There's okay. a lot of kids there whose parents are professors. And so, um, you know, it wasn't just like, there's no, there's no people of color in this town. There was. Okay. Um, and, but I remember we were part of the, I mean, we were part of the Underground Railroad and we were burnt down like two times by the South, you know, like, yeah. and that's part of our history. So we grew up knowing that there was violence, you know, regarding slavery in my, in my hometown because we learned about it. It's part of the history of my town. And I do remember uh, when I moved to Nashville feeling like, wow, it's different here about race. Like it was just yeah. different. And yeah. I feel like it's affected me. Um, I don't have a lot of people of color that are in my circles. It's lots of white people here. And, yes. A lot. Um, <laughs> And I, and I remember going home with my first boyfriend to his hometown in Mississippi. And I remember us crossing the railroad tracks and he locked the doors. And I go, did you really just lock the doors? It's like, it's like, yeah, you got to lock the doors over here. I'm like, I don't know. Do you? Like, do you? <laughs> I don't know. Like you're... <laughs> and I don't mean to minimize when people feel danger, but it's just right. very instinctual when people feel danger because of a yeah. whole neighborhood. Right. Like, right. even when people talk about, like, in L.A. walks in certain areas, I'm like, I used to work with Tyrese and stuff. And, I, no, would I go there late at night or would I would I go there by myself? No, but that's because I'm a woman in general. Um, right. You're aware of your surroundings. But some of the nicest people I know live there. I'm like, that's where their families bought homes and they grew up. And that's where Sunday right. dinners were. And that's, like, oh. you're judging crime based yeah. on a complete you're just judging it because there's some crime there and you're like why is there crime there let's look at that why are mm -hmm. why is there tensions with police there and not over right. here like right. look at my dad always says you have to look fifty thousand feet up and look at life from a big view everybody looks right in front of them and he's like he always says look from fifty thousand feet up what is the big picture? Why is this all happening? Why are these pieces moving? And right. I think in this time right now, that's what has to be done. A lot of people are wanting to be active and wanting to be involved. And I keep saying, just look, look at the big picture and understand the why. Because once you understand mm. the why, it's very easy to get motivated. It is. Well, when you sent me a video today uh, with a woman who was uh, the woman that was talking with um, Obama last night, yes. what was her name? Oh, um, I forget her name, but she said something powerful today on something that I reposted in my stories about, she's like, police us to them, protect us to protect our mm -hmm. neighborhood. Like we need to be protected. Imagine how different things would be if we were cared for in yeah. the same way that these white neighborhoods are cared for. Imagine everything would be different. Watts wouldn't be the way that it is. Like Watts would be... 
it's it's all the same like let us have a house let us have access to the transportation and the and the healthy groceries yes um, i mean yes. i just followed someone today um the the trap garden yes in Nashville. have you heard yes. of that I have. what an amazing movement that is and uh yeah and i'm like all about that it's like yes gardens healthy foods safe neighborhoods access well that's, everything will be different even with covid like people keep saying why are black and browns affected um disproportionately and yes there is some gen genetic component to it but it's also they we we live we're more likely to live in a food desert um we're more likely mm. to live closer together we're mm. we're more likely to be on a lower socioeconomic level so less access to healthcare, less access to the knowledge of food, less access to going to the doctor. So you don't even know you have prediabetes or diabetes. Um, right. And those are risk factors to all of right. the things. And when you look at that, that comes from, from years and years of oppression. So when they mm. say that COVID is like a racial thing, it really is. Yeah. It really is because it has and it has and it's just shining a light to it it really is yeah and i feel like i mean i know before the rebellion started uh this last week i mean before george floyd i felt like i was being stripped away of everything that was non-essential in my own person mm -hmm. And so I know that's what's happening to our nation right now is that we're being stripped away down to the actual root in the story. Yes. Okay. It's like, you want to take away this and this and this. All right. Well, now we're going to have to really deal with this and there's no getting around it. There's no distractions right now. So I know that lots of people, I know that I just feel, I feel God in this. I feel it. I feel, a. Uh, strong purpose right now to get right what's been wrong and i know a lot of people do i think and i i think i messaged you this earlier about healing and i yeah, watched I a, it. a video where a minister was talking about we can't heal right now because we have an open wound like we're on the sur like we're on the operating table having surgery so let's fix all the stuff while we're open and oh then god i love it together like, and yes. I really got that. I'm like, yeah, we're open. We're raw. And when you're that, like, you might lose some blood. You might, you, there might be times when you're like, oh, I think this is not going to go well. But if we all get together and we all mm -hmm. can agree that wrong is wrong, that excessive force does not help prevent crimes, mm -hmm. that people taking off their body cams and then committing a crime, like there's no coincidences in that. And it's not happening to black men and women then we right. can to collectively start to yeah. heal once we have fixed the problems. But let's fix all these problems while we're open. Like, I love it. We let's, can let's heal. It open. Let's have this surgery. Like, it's needed right. for survival. Absolutely. God, I love that. See, that's, it's like, yeah, it's, we can't heal right now. Let's fix what's wrong. Exactly. If you heal right now, we left, we left a wrench in there. Yeah. Like, you can't heal it now. We There's still have our another injection, out. and we're going to have to have another yes. operation. And I'm like, I yes. don't want to have any more operations. I want to get it done right now. I don't care if it's messy. And Girl. I always said, um, you know, John Tucker, I think I talk to him all the time. And we're two, we're a generation apart because he's in his 20s. And I keep, I said to him the other day, I said, I think I understand why I'm in Nashville. Because everybody was like, why are you moving to Nashville? And LA had died for me. Like LA, I was unhappy. Yeah. I wasn't getting work. I wasn't singing. I, I was like, I'm going to move to Nashville. Um, Mickey Guyton had told me to move to Nashville. A few others, um, Rob McNally. And I was like, okay, I'm coming. And I got here and I was like, what is my purpose here? And I really do feel like I was supposed to be here <laughs> in this time. And I'm talking like wow. even a few weeks ago, I was talking to my sister and I'm like, maybe I need to just come back to California. Like, Maybe it's just not the place for my voice. And then all this stuff started coming to light and I felt the need to start um, my Instagram live series. And I felt the need to talk Girl. about my life and to talk about 
why I do music and by things that have hurt me in music and things that could hurt the next generation and race. And I kept coming back to race. I'm like, me being biracial has helped me. It has hurt me. Um, if I was white, I'd be a lot farther in my career. Um, yeah. If I was darker, I'd be worse off in my career. It's, wow. I've gotten jobs because I'm lighter and people think I'm Hispanic. Like it's <laughs> like, like, I'm like, I'm not. Oh my but God. I'm like, I'm always like, thanks. I'm not, but I'd take you. I'm like, I'm Creole. <laughs> But, oh my gosh, yes. But I'm like, if people, so, if I don't yeah, see now it, you know your purpose. Yeah, I now found you my can purpose. see it I, just in a matter of two weeks. And my votes, and I look and like, my vote matters in Tennessee. And not to say it does not matter in California, but California has a lot of people speaking, especially in the areas that I lived. And Nashville doesn't have the same amount of people speaking. And I'm around white voices. And if oh I God. can get those white voices to talk to other white voices, like there are places I don't sing in Nashville because I feel like the owner is racist. Like I just won't sing there. I could make a lot more money. I could make right. a lot more money. Absolutely. Yeah. And not to say that I'll blast them out, but I've, but I share, I go, I don't sing there because I don't support the message. And I'm like, wow. that doesn't mean I need to leave Nashville. I'm just like, I, they don't need, to, I don't need their money. My money will come someplace else. And it always oh. does. It yes. always does. And I always find a gig or a song to sing. Um, I always find a way. Absolutely. Even, even you, you being in Nashville has helped me, like, during this time. Like, I wouldn't have had a rope to grab as far as, like, what to know about what to say and resources. And you just, you just hit me up with some key things that have helped me. And I would definitely not be... Um, hip to a lot of the things that I've absolutely learned in the last couple of weeks if it wasn't for you. So thank you for sharing. Well, and I appreciate you being, how you're saying like you want to talk, this talk um, amongst friends and peers and other people that are white or as like Amanda Seal says, happen to be white. Cause there's, there's yeah. a difference. There are people that are yeah. really for the movement and there's a people that are really wanna do something. And the start is black people can't fix a problem we did not create. Right. And Absolutely. black people cannot fix it alone. It mm -hmm. won't work. And so it starts with the, like the first eight and getting police legislation. Then it will stand on like, then we go into schools and we change what we're teaching and we change how we're funding schools and we change how we're funding the police. That's not saying we don't give people money. It's saying, let's, just, let's spread it out. Yes. Let's, let's change how it's people. If, if nothing that COVID has showed is shown that if you live and you're poor, wh whatever race you are, you need school. So you can't homeschool. If your family has to be at work, you don't have a computer. Um, our how a lot of these cable companies are offering like free internet for like the inner city. I'm like, so you were able to do this. You were able to do this and you just chose to do it now. So let's keep doing this. Like yeah. we're able to do a lot. Oh yeah. That we don't do. So let's just do it. Let's be a, be better humans. And I always have said, since this, this all started, the COVID started, I said, if this teaches us to be better humans, that I'm all for a pandemic because we are not, yeah. we are destroying the earth. We are destroying our land. We are destroying our people. And if, if somebody dying on camera for minutes doesn't make you pause and say, mm. Hey, this is wrong. And I, I shared with you earlier how the mm. only reason I watch this video, cause I don't like to watch black men or women dying and I don't like them being filmed. I think it's unnecessary, but yeah, as my ex-boyfriend um, in LA said, I was in tears and you need to see this stuff. And for him, a six foot, like seven, huge black man to be in tears on FaceTime with me 
I I was like, I need to see what he's seeing that that wrecks him, king him, treated way worse than I have in this life. And I watched, and I I couldn't breathe. I couldn't breathe in that moment of just mm -hmm. knowing the amount of hate in an individual to do that so calmly. And mm. knowing it can't be the first time he did that. Maybe the first time oh. he killed somebody, but knowing you can't be that calm. And the people no. around you can't be that calm in broad daylight with no fear. If your system of life isn't built on that, you just, you just can't. And knowing how many are not videoed daily. In the last week, I've heard of four people that have been attacked or killed by officers. It's the amount of young lives that will never know the power their story has because they were taken from us in such a brutal way is it keeps me up at night. It keeps me up. Yeah. And um, I called my mom and I was like, thank you for, for keeping me safe. Thank yeah. you. I, I can't oh, imagine the racism she amazing. felt. I can't imagine yeah. the racism she felt. And she's 80 now. So what she did she say? She's like, she watched a video I posted on my Instagram stories and she's like, I cried. And I, and she's like, you're my daughter. And I'm like, I know. But you didn't have to keep me safe. Your life was worse because of me. You mm -hmm. were treated worse. Whether you're aware or not, raising a, a black girl with an Afro in, in the late 80s, 90s, in a white suburb could not have made you friends. <laughs> it could not have. Right. Um, it could not have been easy. Mm -hmm. But you kept me safe because you put me in good schools. And yeah. you got me an amazing education. And yeah. I lived in a home with a dog and a cat. I had food every day. I had a snack when I came home. I never worried if I was hungry, ever. Did we have luxury always? No, but we, I was taught structure. And, and I now go on and talk to my dad and he's like, hey, you had a better life than I would have given you. He's like, safety he's like and i was a black man and i couldn't fight for you because i didn't know your grandparents because i was a black man if my dad had been white he probably would have raised me because he would have known all my family and known all the people and so if when my mom right. passed away he would have just taken me but they right. didn't even know him and i was two years old and they didn't know my dad they didn't know him and so I look and I go, how do you change the story for my kids? How do I change the story so my family's no longer segregated? Because my family is segregated. My own family. I have a black side and I have a white side. And let me yeah. tell you, when I get married, that might be the first time some of them see each other in 30 years. Like they, wow. they don't, they couldn't pick them out of a crowd. You just couldn't. And not How did your mom feel about that? My mom's trying more, but mm -hmm. she, she always says, I did the best I could with the knowledge oh. I had. And I think she yeah. did. I think her generation believed that they were doing the right thing. I think she believed that keeping me safe and keeping me isolated protected me. Um, mm. And it did but it also didn't teach me what real life was. And I had to learn it. I and wasn't hair always prepared to, um, like my brothers who were raised by my dad, like they had the talk at six years old about the cops. They had the talk about what to say, what you don't do. Um, I didn't have that talk. When I started wow. getting pulled over, when I left home, because all the cops in my neighborhood knew me, I'm from a small suburb. But when I went to a place where the cops didn't know me and didn't know that I just drove an old car, I wasn't expecting them to let make me jump out of the car while they checked my license and registration, standing outside of the car. 
so they can see my hands and my feet. And, and I'm not saying that I'm like the most attractive or thing, but I think I'm a pretty person. You're and very, I feel like I'm, and I'm very oh smiley. I'm not threatening. I don't feel like I'm threatening. I'm like, so how am I threatening you? And I'm 18 and standing outside Weird. of this car and God. with four officers, four male officers checking my license and registration and shining light for my car to see if I have paraphernalia or anything. Oh that. my I, God. And I'm like, what? And I didn't even know Unbelievable. Who my rights were. Like, I don't need to step out of the car. Like I didn't have to, they had no probable cause. Um, but I didn't know that because I didn't have, my mom never talked to me about that because she never experienced it. How do you teach your kids something you don't experience? You're a blonde hair, blue eyed woman that looks like Julie Andrews. <laughs> like, and she does, she's blonde hair, five feet tall, like five foot two. She looks like Julie Andrews, reads books. Oh my gosh, yeah. Like, I don't, I am not five foot two. I am five ten. <laughs> and, and whenever this, this would happen to you, would you call your mom and tell her? No, no, I would, um, Stephanie, I would call, I would text my dad and, mm -hmm. um, tell my boyfriend, but I didn't want her to worry about the life I chose and mm -hmm. didn't want her to feel guilty that I, that I was targeted. And it took me a while what to even realize it was my skin. Ah. First, I'm like, oh, it's my old car. But then I'm like, wait, all my friends drive old cars and none of them are getting stopped. And we live in the um. same apartment complex. Why are they not getting stopped? Like I was naive at first. Wow. I've been oh pulled over 20, I, I would say at least 30 times in my life I've been pulled over. Like that's crazy. Like, oh my I've tried goodness, two I'm tickets, sorry. this is insane, yeah. But wow. I've been pulled over at least 30 times. Like I know in LA, I can't count the times I've been pulled over. Or cops, or when I'm parked on the side of a road in like a neighbor, like where I lived, which was a nicer neighborhood, and a cop would drive by and be like, ma'am, are you lost? Are you looking for something? And I'm like, no, I live here. I'm just sitting in my car for a minute. Like I, I live right We're there. a text. Like, thanks. I'm looking at my here. Instagram. Like, yeah, I'm not scouting out trying to break in somewhere or, or being the girl. Unbelievable. My boyfriend like, hey, they just left. You come over, come get it. Like the, the amount, the amount of trauma that I've had to work through and undo and accept. And that's not even what most, it's so little compared to what a lot of my black friends have dealt with mm -hmm. so little because they didn't have, to, they didn't grow up the way I did. They didn't get to grow up in the schools that I grew up in. So I got right. teased for having hair and they got teased. Um, they got teased for being poor. And wow. Right mm -hmm. on. Oh, okay. Chill us Sweet queen. angel. Chill us kid ever. Like, she really is. She's just letting you do your thing. She's happy as can be. This is this is her. This is her energy. My first, her energy is. We all could use some ruby energy. I know. I love that. My first one. My first baby was like that. Second one, not so much. Yeah, I keep telling my um, sister this is rare. This is rare. <laughs> okay, my phone. Well, I thank you so much for sharing this story with me. And can we please do this again? Because yes, I would love to. I want eye opening. My goodness. I know there's been like talk and some people are like, I don't want to teach my white friends this or this because they're mm. tired. I heard that. But as somebody who is biracial and had to herself learn my history, oh my I had to get stacks of books. I had to learn because I didn't mm. know it. I feel that it's, I want people to know it. I, it doesn't exhaust me. Thank you for I that. I haven't had to yes. the same battle where I'm like, I, I haven't had to have the same battle. I have a right. battle and I get judged for my skin every day, but my childhood wasn't like that. So there right. are some traumas that I just never experienced. So if I can so help people that are white, or people that are, or maybe that grew up like me and just never 
we're in touch with the history of why this is happening in the hundreds and hundreds of years of oppression and violence and anger mm -hmm. and rage and the laws that are making this possible. Because I keep reading this everywhere, and I'll say this before we go, is um, I keep reading that America's not broken. Everybody's like, we need to fix America. America's not broken. America right. is working exactly like it is designed to work. The way yeah. it was built to work is how it's working. It is built right. for the white man. It's not even built for the white woman. It is built for right. the white man. And if I see one thing in Nashville, is that white men do thrive. They oh do. yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah. And it's not, and their privilege isn't necessarily their fault. They were born into it. Just acknowledge mm -hmm. it. Just acknowledge that right. being a white man puts you up in this world. Acknowledge right. it. Just acknowledge it. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. But right. it is proof. This country was built for you. It was not yes. built for me. It was not. Right. It was not even built for you. <laughs> right. So. It's and you know what? The more, I mean, you should write a book. I mean, I feel like that, I mean, if you want. But I'm just saying, like. My dad. That, exactly. That's you're, you're a real gift. You've been a gift to me. And, and I know Becca just said thank you. Thank you. My friend thank Becca's you. on here, and she just was saying thank you. And, like. Yeah, the the fact that you're open and sharing your story with me right now is just like means the world to me. I can't wait till we can do it in person on blankets. I can't six wait. feet apart. Few, Let's go. Yes. Oh, yes. You know me. I believe in masks. I believe in social yes. distancing. But we go outside. We got this. We got, we got our this. hike. I'll be back Soon in a few seconds. Back. But anytime yes. you want to jump on here, I'm always willing to have a conversation as long as you don't mind. Like. My rocking. My rocking. I love the rocking. Because my children were more quiet than I would have them rocking the other day. Well, it, it, I say it's the perfect age. Yes, it is. <laughs> She's only it five is. Minutes. She can't talk. She just can laugh. Blessings to you and blessings to Ruby. Thank you so Thank much. You. And I'm going to post this on my Instagram for anybody that couldn't see it at the exact time that we were doing it. But Thank you love so you, girl. much. And I love you. Thank you. Love you too. Thank you for watching. See you soon. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.